Well, good morning. Good morning to you folks that are watching on video. Let me remind you to uh, pause the video, print out your lesson notes that you received so that you'll have them ready when the lesson starts. Sharon was talking about the fact that in the message today that uh, the, uh, the gentleman came out of the fire not even smelling like smoke. I was a smoker for more years than I'd really like to count. I'm just glad I don't go anywhere smelling like smoke anymore. <laughs> well, we've got a guest with us today, Ron Donahue. Good to have you. Welcome. Hope, uh, hope we're nice enough that you'll decide to come back. <laughs> Gentlemen, Romeo's this coming Saturday. Let me see a show of hands of those of you that would like to attend this uh, this Saturday. Okay, thank you. I'll give them a call. We can relax now. Andy's here. I I assume that you got your email this week concerning the equipping, the uh, leadership equipping that we are not having one tonight. So if you didn't get the note, make a note of that because we'll not be here. I have one announcement that I need to uh, bring to your attention and it's the Winter Bible Conference. Just to let you know some of the plans that we have, Johnny, Hurt, Johnny Hunt will be here. He's with the North American Mission Board, Wes Hamilton, Hewland Street Church, <coughs> James Merritt, Cross Point Church, Julio Arrio, Southern Baptist of Texas Convention, Fred Luter, Franklin Avenue Baptist Church, and the musical artist is Karen Jackson. So that's February uh, 20th through the 23rd. They've been really good. We're, we're going to be asked, we have been asked, but I'm not sure what particular evening it is if we would uh, as a class, pack the pews. So we'll let you know farther down the road what night that we decide and, uh, and ask that if you can possibly get there that, uh, that you attend that night if you don't attend any of the others. But I would recommend as many as you can. Does anybody have anything they'd like to bring up today? Okay. Uh, well, let me, uh, let me give you a little statements about uh, that's surrounded by the fact that aging gets tedious, don't it? <laughs> I don't always go the extra mile, but when I do, it's because I missed my exit. <laughs> I see, see people about my age mountain climbing, which is amazing. I feel good just getting my leg through the, my underwear without falling down. <laughs> a recent study has found that a little women who carry a little extra weight live a lot longer than the men who mention it. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Having plans sounds like a really good idea until you realize you have to get dressed before you can go out. It's weird being the same age as old people. <laughs> this one you're gonna have to, to hang in there with. If 2020 were a math problem, it would probably go like this. If you're going down a river at two miles an hour and your canoe loses a wheel, how much pancake mix would it need take to re-shingle your house? <laughs> I think there's a lot more truth than humor in that. <laughs> Just a thought, if a cow doesn't produce milk, is it a milk dud? <laughs> or is it an utter failure? <laughs> Going now. Yeah, it is. We all get heavier as we get older because there's a lot more information in our heads. And I'm gonna stick with that story. <laughs> Jimmy, talk to us about Daniel. 
<laughs> okay, let's look at a let's look at a few slides that I found this morning. Here's one: prevent truth decay. Brush up on your Bible. There you are. You got that? Here's a good one. Jesus had his palms red so we would know our future. That good? That's good, isn't it? Here's one. God's garden. Let us be kind, squash gossip, and turn up for church. <laughs> that good? Now this next one here, you might not can see it real good, but it's a sign has to do with Heinz ketchup. It says, catch up with Jesus. Let us praise and relish him because his because he loves me from my head to my toes. To my toes. I, I, did, I did this particular slide about five or six years ago, and Celesta found a T-shirt with this on there. And I was going to call her this week, and you know how that goes. I forgot. But she, maybe she'll wear it next week. You see, so that. Here, uh, here's one. This is a bread box. You know, you open up the top and everything. You've got to learn how to spell if you're going to put signs out there. Please use tongue. Do not touch bread with hands. Tongue. <laughs> you, raise, you raise the lid up and there's bread in there, right? And it says, use your tongue. What does it really mean? Oh. There you go. So you mean, if you're going to work in a place like this and put signs out there, you really need to know how to spell. <laughs> okay. Here's a good one. Maxine again. For my summer diet, I start with a big, nice salad bowl. Then I fill it with ice cream. <laughs> Sounds to me. Here's my, here's my serious one for the day. As I looked at this, look, this is from Charles Spurgeon. Death is no punishment to the believer. It is the gate of endless joy. Now, it, it, when I, I look for these things to put on here it, as, as I'm putting on my slides. And when I put this one on here, I thought to myself, you know, about 10 years ago, I don't think I would have been ready to go yet. You know, but here I am. I'm turning 80 in uh, next month, in March, actually. And uh, you know what? I'm ready to go. Yeah. I'm ready to go. So it's about 10 years' time, uh, from all the things that's happening and all the things that happened in my life and happened in the world, I, I'm, I'm ready to go see Jesus myself. Yeah. I don't know about you. But the older you get, the closer you get to heaven, in other words. Okay? Amen. All right. As I look back on our lessons from Ezekiel, you know, uh, we, we, Harry and R Richard and, and uh, John and myself, we, we meet every Wednesday and go over our lessons and everything. And when we, when we started Ezekiel, we all said, oh, man, this is going to be a tough one, a very, very tough one. But, you know, each one of us at the end of Ezekiel said, my, we learned some great truths out of that thing, you know, okay? out of that book. So as I look back at our lessons from the book of Ezekiel, I remember some nuggets that, I, that really spoke to me from each teacher. There are many more nuggets that you probably got some too. I call these ramos, or they call them nuggets, either one. You probably got some of those too, but I'm just going to share the three that was, meant most, most to me. The first one is from my first lesson from chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. This is where, this is where uh, God in a whirlwind came to Ezekiel in, in, a, in a vision, okay? And so God provided a scroll. The scroll is his written, written word. And God told Ezekiel to eat the scroll. In other words, to eat his written word. God said to fill his stomach with a written word. Ezekiel said as he ate the written word, it tasted as sweet as honey in his mouth. And God added, let all my words sink deep into your own heart. This referred me to James 1.22 in a paraphrase. It said, at some point, it needs to go from being highlighted in your Bible to written on your heart. And that referred to the verse as we know it in, in James 1.22, as we know it, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Now, I don't know about you, but that really spoke to me about, about eating the word. It's, of course, that's a... That's a paraphrase of, of that, but you eat the word. In other words, you eat it, you study the word every day and fill your, fill your heart with it. 
And John shared a tremendous truth from Ezekiel 37 about the dry bones. We'll probably always remember this one. God did not send his son to make bad men good again. He came to make dead men live again. Isn't that good? This will probably stay in my head forever. And last week, Richard shared with us a personal song that came from Psalm 39. You are there. Some of the words says, I can never be lost to your spirit. I can never get away from your love. Wherever I go, you are there. Mm. And then at the end of Ezekiel, the very last chapter, the very last verses in, in chapter 48, a promise that God made to Israel. Israel's vision, Ezekiel's vision, closes with assurance. God will restore repentant Israel and its worship and will mightily bless his people. And here's what God said. The name of the city fulfills the prophecy and the promise that the Lord has given to restore Israel. Namely, he changed the name of Israel and it became the Lord is there, Jehovah Shammah. Now here, here's, here's a good kicker. This, this is a picture. The principle happened about 450 years later. God sent his son Jesus to become, to be born, to take the place, to, uh, to, to take our place in, in sin, okay? So when Jesus was born, what, what did they, they said, he shall be called, what? Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Now what does Emmanuel mean? God with us. And 33 years later, Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He was buried and he was resurrected and on his way, on his way up back up to heaven, the Holy Spirit came to dwell among us, dwell in us. So we, we have the picture of God with us and God in us. Okay? This is, this is the, the great story of Ezekiel. Everything in Ezekiel can be applied somewhere in the New Testament. That's amazing to me. Okay? Now, today we're going to start a six-week study in the book of Daniel. Look at that. Double dose, right? Uh, Do y'all understand what I mean by double dose? Three weeks ago, three weeks ago, the pastor began a series on a study of Daniel. And he did chapter one. And uh, who, Stuart, Stuart did chapter two last week, and Danny did chapter three today. So I'm going to be doing chapter one today. And Richard's going to be doing chapter 3 next week. So only Richard could come up with something that, that would take the place of what Danny was saying today, okay? So it's going to be an interesting thing, us going together. But it's a challenge, and God, God's got this under control. Even though there's some miscommunication about what's going on, God's in total control about what we're going to be teaching, okay? So with all that, the introduction to Daniel there, there, is, there is so much introduction to Daniel. I believe we could almost take two time periods just to talk about all of that. Daniel's name means God is my judge. And Daniel wrote this book in the 6th century B.C. It records the events of Daniel's life and the visions that he saw from the time of his exile in 605 B.C. until 536 B.C., the third year of King Cyrus, okay? Now, Daniel was a teenager when he was brought into exile somewhere between 14 and 17 years old. According to this book, Daniel served under the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar from 606 to about 562 B.C., and then he served under Belshazzar. Daniel served Cyrus, who was currently who was actually the uh, king of Persia from about 560 to 530 B.C., but he took over Babylon in 539 B.C. The book, of, the book credits Darius the Mede with conquering Babylon, and Darius was king of Persia from 522 to 486 B.C. And Daniel served Darius with distinction until his death. So, Daniel served under four kings in the books of Daniel, some, some of the authors call this the times of the Gentiles. You know, we, would, we only talk about Gentile kings in the book of Daniel. Okay? Now, the Bible does not state how Daniel died, but we do have some indication of his age from his book. Now, here's a little, here's a little uh, 
uh, timeline that I put up, this is a very simple timeline. There are some very difficult timelines that I found, but this is a very simple one. In other words, in other words, uh, right here is where is where Daniel begins his prophecy, uh, his prophecy ministry, right there. And here's where the here's where the fall the fall of Judah, of course, right there. But here's where the seventy years ended. Seventy years of captivity ended there, and uh, and Daniel lived. I mean, Daniel lived right in here under the reign of Darius. This is a couple of years, okay. So according 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 to the timeline provided in this book, Daniel lived about a hundred years. In other words, he was fourteen to seventeen years old when he, when he started his ministry, and eighty five years. Uh, other equals to about 99 to 101 years okay so somewhere in that area all these dates on these timelines you find are plus or minus a few years because some of them are not exactly right and all but most of these are correct until you get to the very end okay so anyway Daniel lived about uh, almost a, about 100 years old now the book's central theme is God's sovereignty over history empires and kings all the kingdoms of this world will come to an end and be replaced by the Lord's kingdom, which will never pass away. That's what we're going to be seeing in the last half chapter, half, half the book. The book of Daniel gives us lessons regarding the sovereignty of God that we need to believe and rest in. And of course, the title of, of the sermons in the, uh, we're hearing from the pulpit is uh, uh, Unshakable Hope. That's what I call unshake, Unshakable Hope, and I call it Unshakable Assurance. In other words, what we hear in the book of Daniel gives us unshakable assurance that he is who he is. There are no circumstances, situations, or crises outside of his rule. That's what sovereign means. Nothing ever happens or is done outside the knowledge of God. The book of Daniel is made up of two halves. The first half, chapters 1 through 6, contains stories from the lives of Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They show how God's people should live in a world that is not their home. Does that sound familiar here? Well, did it tell us that this is not our home? Our home is in heaven. But the Bible, God's word, God's written word tells us how to live in a place that's not our home. Isn't that good? The second half of the book contains apocalyptic visions that Daniel had concerning the end times. And we'll be seeing those. Uh, as we look at those chapters 7 through 12, uh, I'm not sure exactly how many lessons we have in there, but what we're going to see is, is uh, Daniel's visions are almost exactly, almost exactly like John had in the book of Revelation. So it's going to be very interesting. These visions are designed to reassure God's people that in spite of their present persecution and sufferings, God is in control and will ultimately be victorious. The everlasting kingdom of God in the hands of his son as king will replace human governments to bring about a paradise on earth. I'm about ready to see that myself right there, aren't you? <laughs> Our passage today is, is uh, Daniel 1, 8 through 21, but since the pastor uh, did 1 through 7, I, let's go over that again so we can lead into what we're going to be doing today. Our pastor began this series about three weeks ago using verses 1 through 7. We saw that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, takes captive the king of Judah with articles from the temple of Jerusalem. And in other words, the Lord gave him victory over that. And the reason for that is because the Lord told them, here's what I'm going to do because you've been so disobedient. Now, if you remember, uh, we did Ezekiel. Ezekiel comes, actually comes after Daniel. Uh, because Ezekiel uh, was, was only a few years and Daniel's ministry was, was over 70 or the whole, the whole captivity period. So Nebuchadnezzar ordered Aspenaz, his chief of staff, to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah, royal family and other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. So now here's what it said, verse 4. Select only strong, healthy, and good-looking young men, he said, Make sure they are well versed in every branch of learning, are gifted with knowledge and good judgment, and are suited to serve in the royal kingdom, royal palace. Asphanes was, was to train these young men in the language and literature 
of Babylon. And the king assured them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens as a special honor. They were to be trained for three years, and, when, and then they would be entered into the royal service of the king. And Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were four of the young men chosen from the tribe of Judah. You'll know these guys because they renamed these guys. Daniel was called Belteshazzar. Hananiah was called Shadrach. Mishael was called Meshach, and Azariah was called Abednego. And if you'll notice through the, Bible, through the rest of the story after chapter 1, they, these guys will be called Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but Daniel will always be called Daniel for some reason. I guess because he wrote the book and he liked the name best, right? Okay, anyway, wonder why, wonder why their names were changed. Well, their Hebrew names offended the king and his Gentile officers. Does that sound familiar? We're living in a day of offending. And here we see back in, uh, back in the 6th century, uh, the, king and, uh, the, the king and his Gentile officers were offended by the Hebrew uh, God. So here's what happened. The name, the name Daniel, meaning God is my judge, was changed to Belteshazzar, meaning Bel's prince. The name Hananiah, meaning beloved by the Lord, was changed to Shadrach, meaning illumined by the sun god. The name Mishael was changed to, with meaning is who is God, who is as God, was changed to Meshach, meaning who is like Venus. Then the name Azariah, meaning the Lord is my help, was changed to Abednego, which means servant of Nego. Do you see what happened here? Do you see what happened? Because they were offended by the names being Hebrew and associated with God, they changed the name. The Babylonians were offended by any reference to the God of Israel. Any reference to God of Israel, they offended them. So they wanted them, and what, what they named these guys? They named them names after their own gods. And of course, their gods were kind of weird. They had gods that, that uh, pro practiced prostitution, uh, in the temple, in their churches, whatever you call it, churches, whatever. Anyway, they had all kinds of weird gods, and they, so they changed these Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is the names of these gods, too. So they renamed them after their gods. Three years of training for these guys. The purpose of the food, names, and education was very simple. This was an effort of, at total indoctrination working to make these young Jewish men leave behind their Hebrew God and culture. Undoubtedly, Nebuchadnezzar wanted to communicate to these young men, look to me for everything. Wow. Okay, here we are in Daniel. Our passage for today. Our passage for today. I can find it. <clears throat> I wasn't prepared to do this right now, I was I? We're gonna read we're gonna read chapters eight, chapters one, verses eight through twenty-one. Follow along with me. But Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. He asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. Now God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel. But he responded, I am afraid of my lord the king, who has ordered that you eat this food and wine. If you become pale and thin compared to the other youths of your age, I'm afraid the king will have me beheaded. Daniel spoke to the attendant who had been appointed to the chief of staff to look after Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Please test us for ten days on a diet of vegetables and water, Daniel said. At the end of the ten days, see how we look compared to the other young men who are eating the king's food. Then make your decision in light of what you see. The attendant agreed to Daniel's suggestion and tested them for ten days. At the end of the ten days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished than the, other, than the young men who had been eating the food assigned by the king. 
So after that, the attendant fed them only vegetables instead of the food and wine provided for the others. Page two, page two. God gave these four men an unusual aptitude for understanding every respect, every aspect of literature and wisdom. And God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meanings of visions and dreams. When the training period ordered by the king was completed, the chief of staff brought all the young men to King Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and no one impressed him as much as Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the royal service. Whenever the king consulted them in any matter regarding wisdom and balanced judgment, he found them ten times more capable than any of the magicians or sorcerers in his entire kingdom. And then Daniel remained in the royal service until the first year of the reign of King King Cyrus, which was in 539. Look at the character of these men. The character of the young men, especially Daniel, who is the spokesman and the leader of these guys, is, is, what they, is, is that they will not defile themselves with the king's delicacies of wine. This would involve consuming things offered to idols and foods prohibited for Israelites. Now, if you remember back in the book of Leviticus, God gave all the Israelites everything they're supposed to eat and all the stuff they were not supposed to eat. Okay? So basically the king's menu for these guys were every, almost everything that, that went against what, what God told them to eat in Leviticus. So we can see, though, that God is in total charge of this situation. In verse 9, we see, it says, Now God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel. So see, God, God is preparing his plan by, by preparing the heart of this man that's going to do what Daniel asked him to do. The Lord had softened his heart in order for the official to listen to Daniel. God will never abandon us when we stand for him. Daniel entrusted himself to God, and God, became, God came through, though it was, no, not, it was no doubt a stretching experience for Daniel and his friends. You can tell that from the lesson we heard today. It's apparent that Daniel was in touch with God during this whole experience. And we'll find that in chapters 6 and 9 that Daniel was a great man of prayer. God can give his faithful servants abilities that cause even unbelievers to appreciate them. God gave Daniel wisdom for the situation. Daniel asked if he and his three friends could just have vegetables and water instead of the king's food. And the steward was afraid that he might be punished, so Daniel presented a plan that would be a 10-day trial. Now, who do you think gave this plan to David, to Daniel? God was in total control of all of this. And we can tell that Daniel was in, in constant communication with God all the, the whole time. And I tell you what, if you and I were in this experience, we would be in constant communication with God too. But God comes through. At the end of the 10 days, see how we look to compare it to the other young men who are eating the king's food. Then make your decision in light of what you see. And the attendant agreed. Why did he agree? Because God had given him favor with Daniel to listen to him. At the end of the ten days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished than the young men who had been eating the food assigned by the king. How do you, who do you think is in charge of this plan? Well, it's very apparent that God is in charge of this plan because he, he, he nourished them with the vegetables and water more than, than all the fatty foods that they would be eating from uh, uh, the king's plan. So Daniel and his three friends were given only vegetables and water instead of the food and wine provided for train, uh, others during the three-year training period. Then God began to prepare them for his purpose. God gave these four young men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. And God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meaning of visions and dreams. The result? When the training period was over, Nebuchadnezzar was so impressed by these four men that in verse 20 it says, Whenever the king consulted them in any matter regarding 
requiring wisdom and balanced judgment, he found them ten times more capable than any magicians or sorcerers in his entire kingdom. So in verse 21, it says that Daniel remained in service until the first year of the king, which is 539 B.C. Now, there's, there's some several nuggets that I found in here that I, that I want to talk to you about today that God really spoke to me on. And uh, one of them is Satan uses a, a similar strategy against believers today wanting to indoctrinate us into the world system. Satan is in charge of the world system, and we are in the world system. However, Satan tries to indoctrinate us to the world's ways, his ways, in other words. That's why it's constantly, that's why it's important for us, to, while we're living in a, in a foreign land, it's constantly, we need to constantly be in, charge, in, in tune with God, what God tells us how to live during this time. Now, here's what Satan wants us to do. He wants us to feed on what the world offers us. He wants us to identify ourselves in reference to the world. And he wants to educate us. Our, well, he wants us to educate ourselves in the ways of the world. Okay? That's why God tells Ezekiel to feed on his word, to eat the word daily, and put it in your heart, deep in your heart. Now, here's the, it is possible to live a faithful life while surrounded by pagan influences if one serves the Lord wholeheartedly. wholeheartedly. It's possible to live in a fallen world controlled by Satan with all the world, worldly systems that's going on and it's controlled by Satan. It's possible for us to live faithful life in this, in this foreign world to us if we serve the Lord wholeheartedly, with our whole heart. Okay? Now, here's the, here's the next thing. Stand up for what you believe. These guys stood up for what they believed. Okay? Now, 1 Peter 3.15 But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and kindness. He, he adds that on the end there because sometimes when, we're, when we are uh, sharing a people the reason for the hope is within us, we get kind of self-centered in that area. Okay? Here's what I'm going to do. Oops, I didn't even show you that. <laughs> here's, what, here's what happens. In the book of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, they stand up for what they believe, and God saves them from what? The fiery furnace, from eating the bad foods. Oh, they're, you're going to see several things in there. Matter of fact, Richard's going to teach the fiery furnace next week the same thing that you just heard from the pulpit today. But I know Richard can do this a wholly different way, right? We got, we got total, total trust in him. If anybody can do uh, write the life every, every year, you can do that. In other words, here's what I'm saying. We'll see in the Bible the, the people stood up for what they believed. They stood up for God. Today, we still see that. We still people standing up over in the foreign country, especially. I mean, they are very persecuted over there. And you know what? They die standing up for what they believe in God. They die. In the United States, it's not as terrible, but they, we, we have been, we have been being programmed by the world system, by Satan, for years and years and years and years, and it's coming around. Have you seen? They were offended back in five in the sixth century. Today, we see people offended over over the stuff the church does, right? And, over God and so forth. But you know what? The things we stand up for is so, usually so minor, and some of us, we don't do it. The church has been being attacked for the last, I don't know how many years, okay, to, to do certain things. And the way it's going, the way it's going, in just a few years, people are going to be offended by teaching Jesus in the church or sin. And they're going to want us to take all that away too. You know, so we've got to stand, we the church have to stand up for certain things. You know, and if we don't do it, Satan's going to get his way in the church. Okay, so I'm just we're matter of fact. Let me tell you something right now. In the next few months, you're probably going to have a, uh, an occasion to stand up for what you believe. Okay, just leave. I'll, I'll leave that sitting there. Okay. Now, also in the United States, I mean, when you stand up for God, He does not promise you that He will save you physically. 
Okay? The people overseas, most of those people, when they, when they say, do you believe in God? They say, yes, they cut their head off. Right? Well, in the United States, you don't see a whole lot of that. However, uh, a few years ago, in a high school in Columbine, Colorado, there was a lady, this guy was going and shooting. I think he shot 14 or 15 people, killed them all. There was a woman in there, and he walked up to her and said, do you believe in God? And she said, yes, he shot her. Okay? I, I mean, there's a whole book written about this, and there's a lot of stuff that's fiction and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, there were some people in that school that, that stood up for God and got shot. Okay? So that's it. Now, here, here's what I'm going to show you all ago. You remember any of these guys? Remember these guys? I don't know if this came from the first verse, verse, first pass, uh, chapter where they say, you're going to eat fruits and vegetables. And vegetables and, <laughs> become, what did this become? What? Veggie tails. Veggie tails, okay? Here's what. Bob the tomato, Junior the asparagus, and Larry the cucumber. <laughs> they, these guys played the roles of Rack, Shack, and Benny. What, Rack, Shack, and Benny? You know what that is? Yeah. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. On the, the fourth episode of Veggie Tales in 1995, the subject was peer pressure. You know what? They tried to get them to bow down to what? Huh? The chocolate rabbit. Y'all remember that? Holy mackerel, I thought everybody remembered all this. <laughs> Let me tell you something. I, th I think the Veggie Tales started in about like 1993, and they're still going today. However, in, in the first four, four years of 2000, I believe they were on NBC. NBC. What, what NBC does? NBC says, uh, we're going to remove Veggie Tales because we, uh, well, first of all, they, they blame time constraints for the reason that references to God were cut from the series, okay? And then, and then they finally acknowledged in the newspaper uh, the edits were made because the network did not want to appear to be advocating any religion, okay? This is this NBC back in 2006, and they cut VeggieTales off. <coughs> However, VeggieTales is still going, the reason why VeggieTales is not on there anymore is because the, the, the writer and creator of VeggieTales says we are not going to do this without mentioning God. Okay? But let me show you. Here's something I found. It's, called, it's trivia, but it's really important. The biblical stories that were recreated on the show VeggieTales are restricted to the Old Testament because the show's creator made a promise to his mother who earned her PhD in theology that he would never portray Jesus as a vegetable. So, it, so they stayed with the Old Testament, right? She also re requested that the vegetables could not be shown having a redemptive relationship with God, which is why Bob always tells the viewer, God made you special and loves you very much instead of saying us. What he's saying is they wanted to make sure that people knew, didn't know that the vegetables could be redeemed <laughs> instead of humans. They're talking about humans rather than vegetables. This, this lady told her son that. And when he stood up, when he stood up to NBC, they took him completely off the air. But you know what? Netflix took it over. But you have to buy. But you can't. They had like 46 episodes. There are new, no new episodes coming out. But the reason I told you this is because these guys, these guys, Bob the Tomato, Larry, played Rick, Shaq, and Benny, and they were, the, the Nebuchadnezzar king, I forgot who was King Nebuchadnezzar, he was some other vegetable. He told them, if you don't, if you don't uh, bow down to this chocolate bunny, I'm going to throw you in the furnace. Well, they didn't bow down to the furnace, and they threw him in the furnace. And you know the rest of the story. We heard it from the pulpit a while ago. So this is very good. So, I don't know about you, but I've, I, I remember two or three times that I've had to stand up for what I believe because I, I, felt, I felt like someone was trying to push me into, into, into agreeing something that wouldn't happen. And uh, one of the things that happened to me while I was in Decatur, Pat and I were in Decatur, and, and there was a church trying to do some things, and the world was, was convincing this church that they ought, they ought to change some things in the church that was not correct. And so I stood up. And uh, after I stood up, there were several other people stood up, and we, we uh, 
did not do what we're going to do. But I'll tell you what, folks, the world is coming to a place right now, this time, where, where they're going to slowly indoctrinate you into believing that there's things that should be done that are against God's principles. And, and you know what? Some of us Christians are so gullible, and we've been in it so long. What was the, the frog in the, in the water thing? You know, it starts out cool, and he warms up, pretty soon he's dead because it got too hot. We just remember this. Just remember this. And when the time comes, I would like for you to remember that God wants you to stand up for his principles and what, he, what you believe about him in your life. Okay? And he, he will bless you for that. I'm not saying he won't keep you from, from taking your life, but he will bless you tremendously in that. Okay? Okay. Let's pray.